So again, welcome everyone. We're going to study the book of Daniel. Um, and we will be walking through this. I've been asked, how long is this class? I don't know. Um, uh, for those who have been in my class before, uh, I, I tend to cover five, seven, ten verses at a time. Uh, I would say a book this size is probably going to take us nine to ten months. Okay? Uh, for, for scale, when we did the book of John, how long was it? Two, two years, two and a half years, something like that. Okay, we did Revelation. I think we did that in about 10 months. Yeah, so, okay. But uh, before we jump into this, again, we're going we're gonna to actually kick it off with the eschatology end times handout in front of you. But before we do any of that, let me pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for this opportunity to get into your word. Um, to get into the book of Daniel, a book uh, that people often, we, we think it's interesting, but we, but we don't sit down and, and read it and study it, but maybe the way we should. And so, Lord, we ask that you would uh, help us to have uh, sharp minds and, and patience. Um, Lord, that we'd have good memories as we walk through this and uh, see it as your word, as truth, Lord, because that is what it is. And we thank you that you've blessed us with this book of Daniel giving us this just wonderful picture of your sovereignty over history, over, over the past, the present, and even the future, Lord. So again, help us to be good biblical students. We thank you for all that you give us. We ask that you would be with us in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so again, we're going to do this eschatology handout. I have some highlights, okay? It's not going to be the whole thing, so don't get too nervous, all right? And... Um, what we're going to do is, is make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to how we read prophetic text. Okay, It's very important. Daniel, even if you just have a brief interview to the book, you know most of Daniel's uh, second half of it is prophetic. Okay, It is eschatological. It is um, scripture that has been given to Daniel. Okay, This uh, revelation given to Daniel. And it spans from his time going forward even to the millennial kingdom when, when Christ will rule and his earthly kingdom will be here. Um, and, and actually it even gives a little bit of uh, revelation of going past that to the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, And so, if you will, let's look at our packet here. All right, That way we can understand where uh, this class is going to be coming from and the rules that we're going to put into play. Sound fair? Okay, all right. So eschatology, that's just the fancy word of end times, studying end times, okay? There are pillars or rules, or a fancy word, rules of hermeneutics, okay, that we need to understand. Hermeneutics, H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C-S. If I was smart, I would have put it in the packet, but hermeneutics. H-E-R-M-E, nudics, N-E-U-T-I-C-S, okay? All that means is interpretation of text, okay? So there are rules that we need to understand and use when we read biblical prophecy. Obviously, Daniel being a book of prophecy, all right? Here's the first rule we need to abide by as good biblical students. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning. Unless the facts of the immediate context studied in light of related passages and fundamental truth clearly indicate otherwise. For instance, when we read, let's say, the book of Revelation, and it says, uh, the serpent of old, the great red dragon, Okay, we know from immediate context that that descriptive passage is describing who? Satan. Satan okay. So are we saying that the Apostle John is is describing Satan as a real red dragon with scales flying around. No. 
Because we know the context of that specific example of that whole chapter is talking about the adversary, the devil, Satan, okay? And he is using symbolic language, descriptive language, okay, to describe the evilness of Satan. But we know it is talking about Satan. It is not a real red dragon based on the context of where it's found. Does that make sense? Okay? So when we have text that we're studying, we're going to use the common sense, usual, literal, primary, ordinary meaning of the word. Okay? Let's do some examples here. Okay? Old Testament example. We're going to go all the way back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis 15. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now, what is being described to Abram in that passage? Yeah, this is the descendants of Abram, going to be the nation of Israel, right? The Israelites. They're going to be slaves. Where? In some pretend land? No, it's going to be in Egypt. Is it going to be for millions of years? No, how long is it going to be? 400 years, okay? And then they're going to come out of that slavery with what? Great possessions, okay? And so we read this text, and although we don't have all the details... We know that in this context, and then also comparing it to Scripture, we know it's describing the nation of Israel, slavery in Egypt, coming out with uh, with Moses and great possessions going into the promised land. Okay? Straightforward from the text. Okay? Uh, Very quickly, do another example here. Um, Jeremiah 25. We'll go down to number three there. Because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants. Now we read that as history. Jeremiah is writing it. It has not happened yet. Okay? So, but if you were to guess, and you were an Israelite and in Jeremiah's time, and you're reading this, you're thinking, um, wow, I'm in trouble. Uh, God is going to raise up this king and come into my country. In fact, he has a name given there. What is his name? Nebuchadnezzar. All right. Again, this is prophecy that we read in the normal common sense, plain language, and God fulfills it. Okay. Let's look at the New Testament examples. Okay. Uh, Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was going away. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now this is an interesting uh, prophecy because one, it's given by Jesus. It's very specific and recorded in the Bible. But it is fulfilled in 70 AD when the Romans come in, all right, under Vespasian, They come in and they invade. They uh, uh, brutally murder a million or more Jews. The rest go into slavery. And then they destroy what? The temple. All right? Even to the point where there's a fire that started in the temple. The gold starts melting. The gold goes in between the stones. And then the soldiers start ripping the stones apart. Right? So they're not laid upon one another so they can get the gold. Was that fulfilled plainly and literally? It was. Okay. Now, I'm sure the disciples, when they read that and heard that the first time, I'm sure they were confused. Okay, But just because there's confusion or, or, or wonder on our part doesn't mean there's confusion on God's part. Make sense? Okay. All right. So again, plain sense of Scripture, the usual, ordinary, primary uh, meaning. And we're not going to look for any other way of, of interpreting it okay, other than what it actually says on the page. All right. Go to D there on part two. So if you use this hermeneutic, this plain, grammatical, contextual hermeneutic, using these rules, okay, you are also following the fact that is the hermeneutic that Jesus and the apostles used 
as recorded in the New Testament. Okay, When they talk about, let's say, um, uh, Jesus explaining in Matthew, and he mentions Noah. Okay, Were there prophecies given in Noah's time? Yeah, Noah was even warned about the flood before it was going to happen, right? Okay, when Jesus talks about Noah, does he talk about him in, like he's some imaginary character used to teach a lesson on, on evil versus good? No, how does Jesus talk about it? Real person, historical person, and historical event. Okay, Jesus does that talking uh, towards the past and fulfilled um, events, real people. He does that also about the future. Now, again, if you use that hermeneutic that Jesus uses, the apostles use, that we are to use, okay, here on D, it says this. If you use the normal, historical, grammatical, contextual, plain sense of the scriptures, you will arrive at a, these are just some fancy words, pre-tribulational, pre-millennial view of eschatology. And the two most respected opponents of that view admit this. And I have those quotes down there as well. To those, again, this is in your vocabulary list. Pre-tribulational, pre-millennial. I'll explain that real quick. What that means is you have creation. Here, here's the general sense. You have creation. You have the Old Testament, the coming of the Messiah, right? His ministry, his death, his resurrection, the age of the church, which we are living in right now, okay? The next major eschatological or end times event to happen on God's timeline is what? Yeah, the rapture or called the harpazo. That is the catching away of the church, okay? And then there's this time frame introduced called the great tribulation, Okay, so do you see there in D where it says pre-tribulation? That's what we're living in. We are living before the great tribulation that we're going to learn about in Daniel. And we're going to learn about later on some other verses um, and passages we talk about in Matthew and also in the book of Revelation. So has the great tribulation happened in Daniel's time? No. Did it happen in Jesus' time? Has it happened in the last 2,000 years of church time? No. So that means, again, if we use the normal, contextual, grammatical, historical way of looking at the verses, if God has not fulfilled that prophecy yet, that means it's going to happen sometime in the future. Okay? So again, you're going to see this in Daniel as well. So we've got to make sure we have all kind of these rules all down. Okay? Premillennial. We are living in a premillennial age. Meaning, before the what? Millennium. So there's going to be a rapture. There's going to be a tribulation period. Then there's going to be a millennial kingdom. Okay? Now, if you study Revelation, how long is that kingdom going to last here on an earthly scale? A thousand years. That's why it's called a millennial kingdom. Okay? That also will be described in the book of Daniel. Okay? So again, we have that on the forefront as we go through this. All right? Go to E there. And this, to me, is the core rule or proof of this is how you understand prophecy. Okay? There are 354 specific messianic prophecies recorded in the Bible, and Daniel has a lot of them. Okay? Christ literally fulfilled... 109 of these in His first coming. Therefore, biblical students surmise that the remaining 245 will be what? Literally fulfilled in His second coming. You and I as biblical students, we are not allowed okay, to just change willy-nilly on how we read Scripture, how we read Daniel, how we read prophecy, Okay, between the first coming and second coming of Jesus. All right, let's, let's look at some examples here so you kind of see it. In Genesis 3.15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. You shall bruise him on the heel. Okay, 
So that's going all the way back to Genesis 3. That's the first messianic prophecy given in the Scriptures. All right? How was it fulfilled? Matthew 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows when His mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the what? Holy Spirit. So Jesus was fulfilling this seed of the woman, her seed in Genesis 3, the virgin birth. Okay? So it's prophesied, and was it literally fulfilled in Jesus' life? Absolutely. Okay? Um, oh, that's Pastor Matt calling me. I bet he had his baby. I should put him on the phone. Okay, hold on a second. I don't know if it's going to work. Hey, brother. Hey, bro. Hey, you're on speakerphone with uh, like 25 people listening. And I'm not kidding. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm dead serious. We're right in the middle of class. Healthy? Doing good. Mommy's healthy. Healthy? healthy. Fantastic. Healthy. Doing great. All right. <laughs> We've been praying for you, brother. I appreciate it. Six pounds, seven ounces. And two and a half inches long. Miss Isla May Brown. Isla May Brown. Oh. I like that name, man. That's awesome. Yep. Well, hey, congratulations. And I know you're tired. I'll probably call you after the class anyway. No worries. All right, brother. Yeah, I'll talk to you. All right, bye. bye. Just a side benefit of coming to class. So, <laughs> okay. Um, look at number two there of these messianic prophecies. Born of King David's line or seed. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now we know Solomon, right, is, is the son of David, okay, and he builds the temple and we have a partial fulfillment, but did his kingdom last forever? No, I mean, goodness, Israel splits into two after King Solomon so we know ultimately that is fulfilled in Jesus. Now think about this. We know that he rules and reigns in his church, in our lives, in our hearts, and in our minds, right? But does he have this earthly kingdom that is promised to King David's line? Does he have that fulfilled yet? No, so that means it's going to be fulfilled when? Future. And you'll get details of that in the book of Daniel, okay? Quickly, we'll, we'll go through here. Born in Bethlehem, he's going to, number four, he's going to teach in parables. Um, he's going to literally ride in on a donkey. That's prophesied in Zechariah. Did that literally happen in the ministry of Jesus? Absolutely it did, okay? Um, and you, you go through, I put a lot of these in there just to make sure you understood. This is not just Pastor David's way of looking at Scripture, okay? I'm trying to force you to see that Scripture is going to put you into a corner. Okay? If you, want to, if you want to read and understand Scripture the way Christ did, the way the apostles did, the way the prophets did, the Scriptures are going to force you to use these rules. And you're going to end up, okay, looking forward to a future time where Christ returns. There's going to be a millennial kingdom. All right? So there's going to be a great white throne judgment. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. All of that described and introduced in Daniel, completely fulfilled sometime in the future by Christ. Does that make sense? Okay? All right? Um, one last thing. Oh, and really, you can take this packet with you and kind of go through it. And I try to define all of these terms to the best of my ability using as much Scripture as possible. And, and again, like I said, Daniel comes up a lot in this study of the end times, okay? So use that uh, as you will. Use that also with the um, vocabulary list. Um, but as of now, let's get into at least the introduction page of the book of Daniel. Okay? Um, it should start with title. Do I, is that? Okay, good, okay. Title. According to Hebrew custom, 
The title is drawn from the prophet who throughout the book received revelations from God. Daniel bridges the entire 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. That's 605 to 536 B.C. Nine of the 12 chapters were a revelation through dreams and visions. Daniel was God's mouthpiece to the Gentile and Jewish world, declaring God's current and future plans. Okay? Author and date. We know this is the prophet Daniel. But specifically, okay, and we're going to get into this later when we get to verse by verse, there is a large portion of Daniel not written by Daniel. Who's it written by? The converted, saved, and believing Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? All right? So at that point, Daniel, all right, just like Moses did, just like in uh, the New Testament Luke did, he compiles the revelation given from another author, brings it into his book, all under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So again, there's a, a most portions of Daniel are written in Hebrew. The portion by Nebuchadnezzar is written in Aramaic. Okay? And we'll, when we get to that, we'll get into the specifics of it. Okay? And you can see that. Um, again, author and date, several verses indicate that the writer is Daniel. His name means God is my judge. Okay? And again, you, we're not going to go through all that tonight, but the date is we have at least six centuries before the birth of Jesus. Okay? Um, the, the fact that we have six centuries of the authorship of Daniel, this book being in existence, and getting to Jesus, uh, the Messiah, is one of the main reasons secular scholars, they hate the book of Daniel. They, they wish it did not exist. Okay? Because Daniel is one of the greatest proofs for the true um, messianic proofs that Jesus truly was the Son of God, the divine Son of David, that He was the Messiah. Okay? It is so detailed, the book of Daniel. Okay? Secular scholars, they do their best to try to say, oh, no, 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 no. Daniel, it's some book written, it's got to be well into 40 or 50 A.D., not B.C. Okay, And they argued this for about 300 years. Then they had a huge problem in 1948 with the discovery of what? The Dead Sea Scrolls. And then they realized, oh, this is not good. Because we have text of Daniel now that are proving the fact that it is at least 600 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And they don't know what to do with it. Okay? So, author and date, again, like I said, um, most probable, you skip down there, at 530 B.C., 536 B.C., is when Daniel writes this book, compiles it together with um, uh, also the, the portion of by Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? Um, background and setting. Let's do that real quick. The book begins in 605 B.C. when Babylon conquered Jerusalem and exiled Daniel, his three friends, and others. It continues to the eventual demise of the Babylonian supremacy in 539 B.C. when the Medo persian armies conquered Babylon and goes even beyond that to 536 B.C. After Daniel was transported to Babylon, the Babylonian victors conquered Jerusalem in two further stages. Both takeovers, they deported more Jewish captives. Daniel passionately remembered his home, particularly the temple at Jerusalem, almost 70 years after being taken away from it. Daniel's background is alluded to in part of, uh, by Jeremiah, who names three of the last five kings in Judah before captivity. Okay, So know this, Daniel is a young man probably a teenager, 13, 14, 15, maybe 16 years old, when the Babylonians come into Israel, they come into Jerusalem, they capture him, his three friends and others, and take them to Babylon. Okay? And we'll get into a little more detail here in a minute. But you need to think of Daniel as a God-worshipping, Yahweh-worshipping, aristocratic 
Jew. Okay? More than likely, his family had ties not only to the temple, but really the kind of the leadership of Jerusalem and Judah. Okay? So um, he, he's going to have some political ties. His family's going to have political ties. They, they probably have some pretty good wealth. All right? And this is the background that Daniel is coming from. All right? So we have this, this uh, kind of uh, uh, wealthy aristocracy background. He's captured and enslaved and brought to Babylon where he spends the next 70 years of his life serving in Babylon. Okay? So that's your basic background, very basic background to this book of Daniel. Are we okay? Questions so far? Uh huh. Um, oh, oh, you mean like where, where like the Bible says it existed, and secular people are saying it existed, or, or what's going on at the time? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here to keep it straight in your mind, this is this is the easy part. Two thousand BC is Abraham. One thousand BC is King David. Okay, this is roughly 600 BC. Okay, so that's kind of the general time frame that we need to be thinking about. Okay, um, but you you have the empires of Egypt already starting. You obviously you have Babylon, and you're going to have Persia, and later on you're going to have the Greek and Roman empires. But that's your basic time frame of of what's going on here. Good question. Okay. All right. Let's read the first seven verses of chapter 1. And then we'll get into this in a detailed fashion, verse by verse. Okay? Verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Um, whenever you see Chaldeans, Chaldeans and Babylonians go hand in hand. They're not exactly the same people, okay? But the Chaldeans give rise to the Babylonians, all right? Verse 5. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name uh, Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. All right. Basic introduction written by Daniel, these first seven verses, okay? All right. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Like we said before, specifically verse 1, this is 606, 605 B.C. Biblical scholars agree on this. Secular scholars agree on this. So in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, okay, he is the son of Josiah. Okay. And then this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. This Nebuchadnezzar is the son of Nabopolassar, N-A-B-O, P 
P-O-L A-S S-A-R Nabopolassar. It's going to be either Nebuchadnezzar's father, could be his grandfather, but either way, he's the king of Babylon right before Nebuchadnezzar takes over that empire. Okay? He inherits it from that guy. All right? Again, Nabopolassar, Nebuchadnezzar, and this time frame, no one argues it. Biblical scholars don't argue it. Secular scholars don't argue it. Okay? So in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. You see where it says king of Judah? You have to remember, after Solomon, the, the kingdom had been split into two. The northern half was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. That northern kingdom, about 100, 160 years before, they had already been invaded and taken over by the Assyrians. Okay? So only the kingdom of Judah is left, where we get the name Jew. The kingdom of Judah. Okay? So in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar. Shinar, Babel, Babylon. All the same area. Okay? You study Genesis. The first real central location of pagan worship. Satanic, demonic, pagan, anti-God worship is east of Eden into a land called Shinar started by a man named if you took the Genesis class Nimrod. Remember him? Nimrod and Shinar? Okay. He sets the standard for that area of being pagan, anti-God, Demonic, satanic, okay? And again, it's no different here. Babylon is centered in this land of Shinar. This history of pagan, demonic, satanic worship. Okay? The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Why in the world would God do this? I mean, make no mistake, what, how does Daniel put it in verse 2? Who's responsible for this invasion to... To be allowed to happen. God. God allows it. It's orchestrated. Okay? Now the reason the Lord allows this invasion to happen is because the nation of Israel, while they were in the promised land, did not keep the Levitical or Mosaic law. And specifically, they did not keep what is called the Jubilee law. And basically that was... Um, they had a reset button, okay? They were in the promised land, and uh, every seven years, then every 49 years, then every 70 years, they had certain rules that they needed to follow so that it made sure that the promised land division of all the tribes, that the land would stay amongst the tribes, that they would continue doing the correct sacrificial systems, okay? God says, you have not done that. You owe me 70 years, okay? Okay? And because you, nation of Israel, were disobedient and you owe me 70 years, and I don't think you're going to give it to me, I'm going to have the Babylonians come in and they're going to force you to give me those 70 years. That is why it says the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. That's Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? It continues. Along with some of the vessels of the house of God. Okay, this would include the lampstand. Uh, 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 the altar of incense, um, the table for showbread, all the, the priestly instruments and furniture that are in the temple, including what? The Ark of the Covenant. Okay? 
So the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. This his God of the Babylonians and the Chaldeans is Marduk. M-A-R-D-U-K. Marduk. All right. This is this is Satan. Okay. Goes by Marduk. Later on, he goes by the name Molech. M O L E C H. Also goes by the name Bel. B E L. And the famous one he uses, Beelzebul. I don't know how to spell that one, sorry. Beelzebul. It's in Mark chapter 4. You can look up there. <laughs> okay. B E E B E E L Z E B U L. Lord of the Flies. Okay? Pagan worship. They're in the land of Shinar. Nebuchadnezzar comes in. So, uh, it, it says there, it, to the house of his God. That's Nebuchadnezzar's God. So, is Nebuchadnezzar a pagan before all this? When all this is going on, is he a pagan? Yeah, he is. He's a pagan king. Okay, And he says he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. So in the Near Eastern historical tradition, you go and invade a land, you kill half of them, you turn the other half into slaves, you go into their temples or their houses of worship, you steal their instruments or their idols or their statues, you bring it back to yours and you put them at the base of your statue of Molech or of Murdoch. Okay? Or Marduk. That's your basic play here of what Nebuchadnezzar is doing. He learned that from Nabopolassar. And this is just how the, the pagan kingdom functioned. This is what they did. Okay, To them, it was just another god of another kingdom that they invaded and took over. Okay, They don't come out until later on they figured out, oh, this is the one true god and we have a problem on our hands. Okay, so, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God, into verse 2. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles. Again, this is where the scholars are saying, hey, this Daniel, he, he's, he's of a noble family. He's got a connection with the Jewish royal family. He's probably wealthy. Raised in the kingly court system. Okay? Um, this is fulfilling another prophecy of Isaiah chapter 39. Decades before, Isaiah predicting this would happen. Okay? At, at least... 50 years. Some would argue up to 100 years. But Isaiah uh, chapter 39, it says this, starting in verse 5. Then I say, Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left. And some of your sons who will issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Isaiah predicted it before. Again, can you understand what Isaiah is predicting and prophesying? Yeah, it's simple, right? There's going to be an invasion. Um, this Babylon king is going to come in, going to take over, take over the vessels, and take some of the nobility back with him, these um, sons and grandsons of yours. Okay, Prophesied by Isaiah under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, fulfilled literally, plainly, in the time of Daniel. Yes. Not really. They were mostly the Chaldean Empire at that point. So even the fact that he's using the word Babylon 
was kind of prophetic. Okay, Isaiah even uses the, the, um, uh, the name King Cyrus way before there's a King Cyrus walking around. Okay. Okay, so the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of the officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, uh, chief of his officials. Uh, think of like uh, the White House chief of staff. That's who this guy is to Nebuchadnezzar, okay? Uh, he, he's not of a royal order, but he is the chief worker under Nebuchadnezzar, all right? So he's going to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, Verse 4, youths in whom was no defect, defect. okay? So there's, there's no disabilities, there's, there's no disease, there's nothing like that, okay? Who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. Again, also a good argument as to why we think Daniel is of noble family lineage, Okay? And he ordered to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Okay? So the, these um, young men are being taken from Jerusalem, from Judah. They're going to be taken to Babylon. They're going to be taught their literature, pagan literature, and the language of the Chaldeans. Now, I want to make a, a short thing here on the Chaldeans. I've already kind of mentioned it already. Um, so the Chaldeans, um, they do exist before technically the, the empire of Babylon, okay? They give rise to it, but the Chaldeans were not really a military style empire. They were, um, uh, the best biblical word to describe them would be magi, okay? They are one, soothsayers, they are, uh, magicians, um, they existed in the courts of Egypt. They, uh, they existed in all these different courts. They, they were the ones that supposedly were gifted with prophecy and, and giving predictions and things like that. That's The Chaldean Empire really focused on that. They were not about military expansion. They were about collecting knowledge and occultic black magic knowledge, if you will. That's what the Chaldeans were about. They are more or less military militarily conquered by the Babylonians. They don't wipe them out, but they bring them in and make them kind of court officials because they have all of this knowledge of this pagan uh, background and religion. Okay, So Babylon, Babylonians and Chaldeans, they're going to be used back and forth, but it's that one group of people that have come together. Does that, that make sense? Okay, all right. So he ordered them to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans, verse 4. Verse 5, the king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and he appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. So they're taught the language, they're taught the literature. This is going to go on for three years. He wants them well taken care of. Yes, they are enslaved. They are Jewish slaves. But they're taken care of in the fact that they are, they're, not, they're not wanting for food or for drink or anything like that. And they're going to receive this education for three years. So the Chaldean Magi, just like the Magi we read about in the New Testament, we'll get there. Okay, Those Magi, M-A-G-I, those Chaldean Magi, are the ones that come in and teach these Jewish slaves. Okay, It's going to, ha it's going to go on for three years. So at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. They would be allowed to be in and around the throne. They would be in the kingly court system. They are going to be pretty high up. Okay? And the Daniel is careful here in verse 6 to name three, I'm sorry, four specific, including himself. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
Now, it's really important we understand this, okay? Daniel, in Hebrew, means this. God is my judge. That's what Daniel means in Hebrew. God is my judge. Okay? In verse 7, then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. Again, this is a common practice amongst the Chaldeans, amongst the Babylonians. We're going, we own you. We've invaded you. You are our slaves. We're giving you a new name. Okay? So Daniel, his name is God is my judge. He's given the name Belteshazzar or Shazar. And it means Bel, B E L. That's Molech, that's Marduk, their pagan god, Satan. It means Bel protects the king. So right off the bat, Daniel is given a blasphemous pagan name. Every time somebody says Belteshazzar, they're saying Bel protects the king. Okay. Second, his friend Hananiah. It means Yahweh is gracious. Okay. Yahweh is gracious. They give him the name Shadrach. It means Aku commands, A-K-U. That's one of their gods, a lesser god, not Bel. Okay, a lesser god. It means Aku commands. His other friend, Mishael. It means no one is like Yahweh. No one is like Yahweh. Mishael. Okay. He's given the name Meshach, which means Aku. A-K-U is powerful. And lastly, and I'll, I'll show you why it's important to know all this. Azariah. Yahweh is my helper. Azariah. Yahweh is my helper. He becomes Abednego. It means servant of Nebo, N E B O, another one of their gods. He was the god of grass and trees. Nebo. N-E-B-O. Sometimes brought in as Nego, N-E-G-O. Okay? Yeah. Um, well, well, in the Jewish world, the fact that they have these wonderful Yahweh blessing names again shows they come from, I would argue, Believing, good, Jewish, Yahweh-worshipping families that are noble. Okay, Now, in the Jewish world, you could have a great praising Yahweh name if you were of nobility or just a normal Jew. That's no problem. Okay, In the Babylonian world, you would have one of these pagan celebrating names, usually only in the nobility royal environment. Okay, So again... 
So we have Daniel. We have these, again, wonderful Jewish names, Hebrew names, praising the one true God, praising Yahweh. Okay? Now think about this. I mean, how often do you hear your name on a daily basis? All the time, right? Okay? So they're hearing this pagan horribleness, all right? Giving praise to Aku and Nebo and, and Mor- Molech and all this bleh, okay? And they're having to hear it over and over and over. Now, the Babylonian court system, they did this on purpose. It's almost like a, it's like a type of brainwashing, okay? Because you're hearing this so many times repeated over and over and over and over. It was their attempt to brainwash these young men. Okay? And so we have here uh, verse 7. We'll close up here. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. To Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Okay? Now, again, if they would have used their Hebrew names, more than likely they would have been what? killed okay but we're going to see their character as we continue to study daniel oftentimes they'll still go by their hebrew names okay all right questions that we're going to stop there questions on what we covered we're okay There, yeah, there's a lot going into it. Yeah, you, you, you have, you have um, I mean, just pagan stuff going in the nation of Israel. You, got, you have kings that are not worshiping Yahweh. You've got a lot of evilness throughout their history. But the, the fact that they get that 70 years of punishment comes to that Mosaic Jubilee law. Yeah. Yeah, Martha. Yeah, that's going to happen uh, next up in Daniel. That's part of what God uses to convert Nebuchadnezzar into a true worshiper of Yahweh. That happens later on, yes. Yep. Okay, we're all right? All right, let me pray. Father, again, we thank you for the book of Daniel. Lord, uh, uh, just a a deep book, a rich book, Lord, that uh, we want to know frontwards and backwards and... uh, we just thank you again of the privilege and opportunity we have to come together and to, to read it together and just take an hour, Lord, and get into, the, into the, the details of it. And Lord, we do this not to puff up our own minds. Lord, we do this so that, Lord, if we, are, if we are so blessed by you to have the opportunity to go and teach it to another Christian, maybe our son or daughter or a grandson or granddaughter, Lord, that we would have the tools and, and the, the knowledge to teach this to another believer so they can enjoy the, the, the description and, and detail of your sovereignty over Daniel's life, over the Babylonian Empire and all of this and how you are sovereignly uh, orchestrating all of history. So, Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you now.